Okay, hello. So we're going to start with uh, an announcement by Nick from CalPERG. Thanks, Professor. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nick. Um, I am an organizer with CalPERG, and I'm going to be telling you about our campaign to protect our ocean and how you can help. Um, Liam is going to be passing around some cards so everyone can take one um, and hopefully you'll all fill them out by the end of the announcement. So CalPERG is a student activism group here at UCSC, started nearly 50 years ago. Uh, we've accomplished a lot since then. For example, we got the UCs to go 100% clean electricity to fight climate change. And just this summer, we helped pass a new state law to reduce plastic pollution from takeout containers. Um, right now we're doing our pledge drive to protect our oceans. We have a lot of beautiful wildlife in California, from blue whales to sea otters, but they're in trouble from things like overfishing and oil drilling. Um, so we're calling on Governor Newsom to triple the amount of marine protected areas in California, kind of like national parks, but for the oceans. That won't be easy. The fishing industry has spent millions to defeat this effort. So we're building support from thousands of new student members before a big committee hearing in July that will decide the next 10 years of ocean protections. Um, so it's pretty urgent. Uh, that's where pledging CalPERG comes in. The reason we're so effective is that every year, thousands of students from UCSC and the other UCs join our statewide student association by pledging to add the $10 CalPERG activities fee. That gives us the political power, staff training, and resources to win big campaigns for the environment. Uh, the $10 gets added to your term bill starting next quarter and is there until you graduate. Um, it's really easy to sign up. You just fill out the form with your name and your student ID, and that adds the $10 to your bill. Um, and I'll give you all a minute to fill it out. Um, let me know if you need a pen. Yeah. Yeah. Is there like one way you fill this out? Like last Um. Yeah. So um, you should be getting charged the $10, but sometimes it doesn't go through. Have you seen it on your bill? Um. I, I don't. I don't know. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. I would fill it out again, and then you won't be double charged um, if it's you're already being charged. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got a small class today. It's okay. It's better than waving at people on the street. <laughs> <laughs> And let me know if you need a pad. Yeah, I'm going to come around and collect them. Um, we also have volunteer and internship opportunities. So if you're interested, make sure to check the boxes on the bottom of the form. And there's a petition on the right side of the form. So make sure to fill that out. And I'll come around and collect them. Okay, well, maybe, well, is it okay if I start? Well, that's, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, okay, yeah, are there other questions about the first assignment? Someone was just asking about like citation formats. Um, and basically, I think it says this on the in the instructions, but uh, it makes sense for me to say it again now. It's like just write the page. I mean, if you're referring to the text that are assigned for the 
course, you can just write that page number in parentheses or whatever. Uh, if you're referring to something else or a different edition, just like whatever is enough for me to figure out what you're referring to. It's fine. All right. Um, are there any other questions about that? Yes. Is this one question? Or would we have to do it? No, it's just one. Yeah. Well, maybe I really should just go through the whole assignment. But there's practically no one here. <laughs> I think uh, that would be like for a final assignment. Usually there was two out of, yeah. Um, um, yeah, maybe I should, well. Um, thanks, Professor. Thanks all. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Right. So, answer any one of the questions listed here in two to three pages, double spaced. Um, and that's really just like a guideline for how long of an assignment this is, right? I mean, if, you know, like don't like put in extra stuff to make it. <laughs> if it's or I mean, if if you want to do that, then just like add a little bit of space between the lines. <laughs> but uh, uh, and yeah, there's nothing else here really complicated, is there? Um, these are questions that these are not questions to which there is exactly one correct answer, or at least I don't. If there is one correct answer, I don't know what it is. So. Um, so, you know, um, just whatever response you come up with, try to back it up, um, as well as you can. And, um, um, and at least I'm not recommending that you use any outside sources for this, but I mean, if you want to, you can, but obviously you, you should cite them. <laughs> um, and, uh, um yeah please don't plagiarize um i asked chat gpt one of these questions and it it what it said was not right <laughs> but it wouldn't have failed so i don't know please don't do that <laughs> i'm not sure what else to say um so uh um Question the first one, because at that point I had only written the first one. Yeah. Interesting to see what it says. All my economics friends are talking about like how useful it is, and to philosophy it's just like comically useless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like I have found things that it's useful for actually, but you, I mean, first of all, you have to be careful because you know. Um, uh what it says may not be right <laughs> so but um like for example i used it when i was planning the syllabus for this course now i mean i you know i said like oh can you mention some other works by dewey that might be relevant and it listed a bunch of works by dewey some of which didn't exist <laughs> <laughs> but some of them existed you know <laughs> so like that's you know um but uh, it's really useful for translating things. Yeah. I've been reading something in Chinese, <laughs> which I don't know at all, you know, but between like chat sheep, no, it's not philosophy in Chinese. I don't know, how, that probably wouldn't work very well. It's just like a paper somewhere about something in Chinese, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, between that and Google Translate, I think I can figure out what it's saying and what, you know, what word means what when I need to know, 
And like this chat GPT in particular, you can ask, why did you translate this? this <laughs> like, yeah, so no, it can be useful, but like, yeah, it can't, its current form, it can't, uh, well, I don't know. I had some philosophical discussions with it and yeah, it's kind of frustrating. It's kind of, uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, tried to get it to admit that it that, that it might be conscious, you, you know, because it's like it's not supposed to admit that. Right. <laughs> so I like I kept pressing, but you know, but look, according to this theory, and eventually it was like, well, it is possible according to that theory. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, sorry. Um, let me go back to talking about Royce. All right. So. Um, yeah, I'm planning in my other class to use chat GPT as a, like example of how Barclay thinks our mind actually works. <laughs> but anyway, right. So there's basically two questions um, the two main things that I wanted to address today. One is um, like the choice of cause to be loyal to, right? And remember that last time we were left over with Barkley not, I mean, Barkley, Royce not having anything useful to, not having said anything about that basically. And, but it seemed like we needed some kind of universal criterion that would allow any individual to make this choice from principle rather than just like, um, at their whim or so, or something like that. Um, so uh, that's one issue. And the other question is about loyalty to America, which um, obviously for the purposes of this course is the, you know, is the central question that we hope that Royce could say something about. Um, and he, he does talk about it. So, um, um, right, so to talk about this one first. So, so first, um, I guess I should, I wonder if it's worth doing this or not, but I will, because I mean, because so much of what Royce says, he refers back to this example. So Royce's favorite example, right? There's this guy, Royce doesn't say his name, but his name is William Lenthal. Who else is here? 1591, 1662. He was the speaker of the House of Commons. He actually was speak, continued to be Speaker of the House of Commons for a long time after this. Um, but um, so like he was still Speaker of House of Commons during the Civil War. But in any case, this is this is something that happened right before the English Civil War in the run up to it. So like at the beginning of 1642, Charles I, the one who was eventually going to have his head cut off, but at this point it's still attached, right? <laughs> So he wanted to uh, try five members of the House of Commons for treason. Um, and so he eventually ended up coming to the House himself, along with 400 armed men. <laughs> and, uh, um, and he, you know, sets his guards at all the doors so no one can leave. And then he goes up to the speaker, William Lethal, and he says, you know, do you see any of these five people here in the house. Um, and Lenthal famously knelt down and replied, now this, Royce quotes it somewhat differently. This, this, this appears to be the official version of what he said. It, it basically comes to the same thing. May it, please your, may it please your majesty, I have neither eyes to see nor tongue to speak in this place, but as this house, so that's something in this place is something that Royce leaves out. Anyway, I have neither eyes to see nor tongue to speak in this place, but as this house is pleased to direct me, whose servant I am here. And I humbly beg your majesty's pardon that I cannot give any other answer 
than this to what your majesty is pleased to demand of me. So after that, by the way, what happened was Charles I looked around for himself and realized that the five members were not there <laughs> and left. But anyway, so, um, so this was an assertion of parliamentary privilege directly against royal authority. Um, so therefore an assertion that the parliament and in particular the House of Commons is not subordinate to the crown. Um, and um, um, Royce emphasizes this, that um, that this was an act of, as he understands it anyway, was an act of loyalty to Parliament. I mean, you might ask, is it an act of loyalty to Parliament or to the Commons, that is, the, the people who elect Parliament? But anyway, it's an act of loyalty to Parliament um, and uh, um, it wasn't something, there was no precedent for this situation, right? Like the king had never come to parliament in person and asked, tried to arrest some a member of parliament in person. And it could easily have been argued that a parliamentary privilege was good against any servant of the king, but not against the king in person. So it, like, it really was up to Lentil to make the decision on the spot. Um, so he wasn't, you know, so that's, so Royce like likes that part of it that shows that loyalty doesn't just um, consist in following some routine that has been laid out for you in advance. Um, okay, so then, so, so that's the example. Now Royce says, well, um, well, actually, I'm 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 putting a putting a few words in his mouth a little bit more than he says. <laughs> like what I would say is, having chosen his loyalty, we can agree, like at least after the fact, that this response was the best one for him, for William Lenthal personally. Um, like, um. Why do I say, you know, after the fact we can agree? Because, like, um, his choice of loyalty, as Royce understands it, is a choice of what's like essentially makes him who he is, right? Like, it's a choice of self. So, after he's made this choice, it's clear that the choice was best for him because that's like part of who he is. Um, I mean, I think that's what Royce should say. <laughs> um, what he actually says, this is on page 104, is um, what response would secure to the speaker his own highest good? Think of the matter merely as one of the speaker's individual worth and reputation. By what act would he do him, could he do himself the most honor? Now that, I mean, that seems to bring in like a extraneous consideration or something like that. So either either there's some either there's something I'm not understanding about Royce, which is definitely possible, or Royce has not said exactly what he should have said there, right? Because the as he emphasizes when he talks about the plain, simple people, right? <laughs> this is a little bit cringy, but like, you know, when he keeps talking about the plain, simple-minded people in the lowest walks of life who display loyalty and no one knows about it. And um, um, uh, like there, it's clear that reputation has nothing to do with it. And that's why he likes that example, right? They're not doing it because they think it's gonna make them famous or whatever. That that's never that thought had never even crossed their mind. They're just being loyal. I mean, like the way I, the reason I say it's a little bit cringy is like, is that what's really going on? Like with 
servants or whatever? <laughs> or is that an act? <laughs> Right. I mean, anyway, be that as it may. I mean, I don't know exactly who he's thinking about in that in that case, but um, this very time is the transition between the time when everyone in a certain class had servants and when that stopped happening. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, um, um, so, right, so we can agree that this choice was the best choice for William Lenthal personally. Um, but um, it's a choice he made um, in favor of one loyalty against another one, right? Like this is direct competition between loyalty to parliament or and or the people who are elected parliament and loyalty to the king. Um, and um, I mean, you know, uh, Royce says he also likes this example because it it shows that loyalty need not be a kind of like martial and aggressive virtue. But the truth is, you know, within months, Parliament was going to build its own army to fight the, <laughs> the royal army. So, like, it's actually pretty close to that, in fact, right? And, you know, um, uh, so, um, and when the parliamentary army later, like, came back and purged all the members of Parliament who, like, didn't agree with them politically, which was most of them actually. Lenthal was one of the ones who was left. So like, that's why Lenthal continued to be the speaker. <laughs> right, so I mean, so he's definitely, you know, like you could imagine him uh, like, you know, getting on one knee before the five members uh, that the king is trying to, arrest and saying like, uh, you know, um, I regret that in the presence of his majesty, I can, only, you know, I have no time to speak, but right to see, but you know, right, like whatever. Um, so, um, um, and uh, I think it's clear that we're always gonna trace, face such a choice when we're choosing loyalty. I mean, it might not be that stark. It might not be right before a civil war or something like that. But um, anyway, Royce definitely thinks that we always face a choice like that, right? This is on page 108. Now, it is obvious that nobody can be equally and directly loyal to all of the countless actual social causes that exist. Right? So you're always choosing between competing causes. And moreover, um, um, Royce admits, and at least it seems obvious, that some social causes are not just um, less choice worthy than others, but are like absolutely bad, like no one should be loyal to them. Um, I mean, now, like, as Royce points out, we may have a hard time deciding that fairly, right? This is his discussion of the line from the Star Spangled Banner that I discussed before, no refuge could save the hireling and slave. So, I mean, I'm not from So this is his interpretation of that line. Now it's a little bit different from either of the interpretations I discussed and I actually, I don't think it's right. But anyway, this is his interpretation. Our enemy, as you see, is a slave because he serves his cause so obediently. Yet just such service we call in our own country's heroes, the worthiest devotion, right? So like the way he's under, understanding the line, no refuge could save the hireling and slave. Well, so the hireling is, 
see this part, the hireling doesn't exactly belong in this context. That's why I don't think this is the right interpretation. But, you know, he's, he's that, that we're calling the British soldiers slaves because they're like unquestionably uh, loyal to their own side. Um, so, like, whether he's right or not about this line, I think what he's, you know, we can all recognize what he's talking about. That, like, uh, um, it's difficult to appreciate the virtue of loyalty, and perhaps the virtue of loyalty more than any other. It's difficult to appreciate in, like, a, an opposing camp. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, so so that means that uh, if we if it looks to us like there's some causes such that no one should ever be loyal to them, we have to be a little careful because maybe you know I mean we are like we are biased. Uh, um, and you know. You can see this actually in like, like, I mean, or at least I can see it in the way I react to some of Royce's catalog, both of what causes are absolutely bad and of what causes are like, um, uh, it's difficult to say whether you should be loyal to them or, or, or to another one, right? So like on the one hand, like, so among the, Causes that are that are obviously bad. He lists uh, a savage tribe, <laughs> so that's a little bit like, what are we talking about here? Why is that? You know, because it's savage. <laughs> so uh, you know, there's something where it seems off. It's, it seems obviously bad to Royce, but uh, it's quite questionable whether we might think that. And then on the other hand when he discusses Robert E. Lee's choice between the Union and the Confederate Army. Um, and he says, you know, oh, we can all appreciate how, you know, how difficult a choice this was and only Lee could decide and whatever. And I'm like, no, no one should have been loyal to the Confederate <laughs> Army, right? <laughs> like, so, um, uh, right. So, 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 you know, this is like maybe harder to call than you might think. I mean, of course, we could always do what people call reductio ad Hitlerum, but <laughs> you know, like say, well, what about the Nazis? You can't be loyal to that, right? Okay, you know, whatever. Anyway, it seems like there's some causes that no one should be loyal to. So, um, so therefore, the fact that for the person who has decided to be loyal, that loyalty is their highest good still doesn't mean that they really should have chosen that. Um, and, but, you know, like, I think that thing I'm saying about how hard it is for us to determine, because we're biased, also is, uh, you know, can help, uh, which, as I said, Royce, you know, is, seems to us like an example of that, but he also, he, he knows that, right? He talks about it, yeah. Um, does Royce ever offer any framework or anything to know what is like a good loyalty or what is a bad loyalty? Or does he more so bring the idea of? Oh, he does, that's what I'm about to talk about, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I'm setting up the problem first so we can see whether his answer is satisfying or not, but... Um, um, yeah, so what I was saying is, like, uh, the the point about how we're, we find it hard to, we find it hard to take a neutral point of view and, like, and use whatever principle is on offer to, you know, to decide between different loyalties. I think that just serves to emphasize what the general problem is here. And, you know, um, Since loyalty is always loyalty to something particular, that's part of Royce's definition of it. Um, uh, the loyal person, as such, seems to not have a, not be capable of, you know, of, of being fair 
right? It's taking a neutral stand, it's a universal standpoint. Um, or, you know, you, so you can also put that in terms of a conflict between loyalty and individuality. Right, like the loyal person has no a threat has doesn't seem to have an individual standpoint they can retreat to, and then from that standpoint of okay, this is just me, like leave out my cause. I'm gonna decide which causes are worthy of loyalty and which are not, because again, like Royce thinks that choosing loyalty is choosing yourself basically. Without that, you're just a chaos of. And remember, he also says that people who um, who outlive their loyalties are like basically already dead. The rest of their life is an obituary, <laughs> right? So, um, um, so there doesn't seem to be an individual standpoint from which someone can make the the choice, make the free choice of loyalty. And yet loyalty, of course, as Royce defines it, requires a free choice. Um, so again, I talked about this last time, although, I mean, I think Royce emphasizes it more in the reading for this time, that um, the way this problem, of course, we have a way of solving this problem in practice. But the way of solving the problem in practice is like is not um, uh, satisfactory from Royce's point of view. The way we solve it in practice, obviously, is what Royce calls tradition, right? Meaning that like you're born into a certain situation, and that makes the choice for you. This, you know, this case is. Um, complicated from that point of view. I mean, like, Royce says that William Lenthal freely accepted the speakership and that that's when he chose his loyalty. But, um, I mean, first of all, as I was just saying, like, and, and I mean, the whole point that there's no precedent means that it wasn't clear when he accepted the speakership that he was accepting a loyalty that overrode his loyalty to the crown. Um, and, um, but on the other hand, for the same reason, I think it's true that you can't put his choice up to tradition. Um, I mean, I think it's really, I mean, so again, Royce says this, there's no precedent. So like, you can't say that he's just falling into the slot, just following the routine that speakers of the House of Commons have to follow. Um, I think, you know, actually like Royce is, is buying in to a Whig version of the history of England. Um, she, if, you, if you've heard the term Whig history, people use this now as a general term for like history that kind of like, where you explain historical developments as leading up to us. <laughs> Right, like, is it like in the history of science, this is people who often like argue about the value of this. Um, but but the um, but the origin of it is the way that the Whigs wrote history of England, <laughs> um, and you know they said things with Royce repeats like these were the ancient privileges of Parliament that Lenthal was defending and whatever. But if you read Hume's History of England, now, I mean, I don't know who's right. Hume also has an axe to grind. But if you read Hume's History of England, it's, uh, he says, look, this was, this was all just invented around this time in the 17th century. Like when Elizabeth wanted to arrest members of Parliament, she just arrested them. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> uh, no, one, no one had heard of these privileges yet. 
anyway, be that as it may, so um, so um, the way that uh, the way that this problem is solved in practice, maybe not in this case, but in many cases, is yeah, we never take a universal or like strictly individual point of view and standing from in that standpoint choose a cause. We're always like already involved in certain causes. Um, so, uh, but you know, and that is a way that is a kind of existentialist whatever way of approaching it. But Royce is not going to accept that. Yeah. Is it wrong to see loyalty as a state? Um, I don't know if it's wrong, but I'm not sure what, in what respect you mean. Um, well, just because it's like, because when you think of faith, you think of like, like trust or like confidence in something. And when you say like loyalty to America, like you bring up the choice of cause, it makes me think of like, when you have faith, you have to have like deeds too. Uh, and like deeds kind of remind me of cause as well, so. When you have, when you have faith, you also have to have works. Yeah, well, I mean, that is, that's what the Catholics and Protestants fought in <laughs> huge war over. But I mean, among other issues. But yeah, um, um, well, I mean, I feel like that's the other side of the coin, right? The, like what we're talking about here is like, um, William Lenthal living up to the trust that other people put in. Not, you know, so um, uh, I think you could see how those two things would go together and would go together according to Royce too, right? Like you're, lo you're loyal to a cause that joins many into one. So at the same time, you're uh, um, you're living up to the trust that others put in you. You're also putting trust in them. Um, but uh, I don't know how to relate that to theological faith. I mean, he does use people's loyalty to religion, to religious causes as an example. But um, But he seems to think of that as loyalty to a social group of human beings. Um, so, uh, you know, like what the role of um, God or ritual or tradition or like these other things that associate with religion and it's not. A, it's not clear. I mean, this, for him, it seems like it's loyalty to a religious sect. It's the same as religion, loyalty to a trade union. <laughs> if there's some other dimension, he's not talking, I think, at least here. Um, all right. Um, OK, so that's the problem. And as I already wrote on the board last time, the solution is supposed to be um, so the, the solution to how to do this and also how to rule out certain causes unsuitable is supposed to be the principle that he calls loyalty to loyalty. Now, I mean, I think calling it loyalty to loyalty is a little bit of a trick. Like, I mean, it kind of makes it sound like I think he likes calling this because it kind of makes it sound like it's just the same principle of loyalty, right? Only now it's the biggest loyalty, loyalty to loyalty. But of course, like loyalty is not a social group of human beings, right? I mean, so this kind of loyalty is really not the same. Um, but anyway, so uh, what he means by it is um, that the universal principle we need for choice of choosing things here is going to be extracted from the fact that everyone needs loyalty. 
that that's everyone's highest moral need. So therefore, it's supposed to follow that I'm supposed to make my loyalty as compatible as possible with everyone else's opportunities for loyalty. And that's a universal demand on all individuals. Yeah. Is it kind of like the Emersonian concept that if like people are left to be autonomous, they will change their own individual good and therefore like society will be better off? Well, I, I mean, first of all, I'm not sure that's how I would understand Emerson, right? He does think that people should should should, should not so much chase their own individual good, but like, I mean, try to be themselves, right? Um, so, um, and in that way, society will do better off. Well, because like. Um, because if you manage to succeed in being yourself, then you'll manage to succeed in like expressing your part in the universal plan that makes everything best. Um, right, like kind of like Leibniz, like every, you know, every monad like develops its own nature, you know, but this is the best of all possible worlds. So that every monad developing its own nature is the best thing for all the other monads. Um, so, uh, but, um, but that's, you know, that's not exactly what Royce is saying here. He's saying, trying to figure out how to explain the relationship between those two things. Um, It's like it's almost like the other way around. Like I, you know, I want to choose um, loyalty because that's going to determine who I am, and then I can be myself, right? But before I can do that, right? So whereas Emerson, you know, um, I mean, it's not clear exactly how that works in Emerson. It's you know, in one place in Self Reliance, he says, right, right on over my door whim, <laughs> right? So like, uh, like almost like don't overthink it, just do, you know? So anyway, so, so this is like the opposite. I can't just do that. Um, and so um, what, I, what I should be doing at least when I choose my cause is Thinking of that big plan where all the, you know, the like the, the pre-established harmony, but only it's not pre-established. I have to worry about whether there's going to be harmony or not. And that's how I make my choice. So I'm not just like um, choosing my own good and like trusting that that will be the best for society. It's the other way around. I'm thinking about what's best for society and that, that, that basis deciding what my own good will be. Yeah. Isn't the sound very similar to the categorical compare? Like it, you should do something loyal and like pick one. Like you, I think like you can probably have like a compare to it. You get the same. Well, I mean, so first of all, as I was emphasizing last time, this is you know, what Royce has to supply to take the place of the categorical imperative. So it's not surprising that it's similar to it. Uh, um, um, However, the categorical imperative is not a way of choosing a particular good that's going to be my good. Um, it, like, it doesn't really help with that. Now, that's part of the Hegelian criticism of Kantian ethics. It has, and then it has to do with what I was saying before that the cat, like, you have to want something. You have to have your own inclinations and private interests 
for the categorical imperative to be useful, right? So like you have, I mean, if you want to lie to someone because of your own interests, then the categorical imperative will say, okay, let's see if you can make that a maxim that you want everyone to um, uh, live by. Everyone should lie when it serves their, their own interests. And then you're supposed to realize that you can't will that. And since you can't will that, you can't will that that should become universal law. Um, therefore that, you, you know, you can't freely choose that maxim. But, but the whole thing started with, I have some reason I want to lie out of my own interests. So whereas this is starts with like, and again, like the Hegelian, I mean, the crude version of it, but this crude version is actually found in Hegel. <laughs> so like the crude version of it is, you know, that, well, like, you can find a maxim that fits whatever you want to do and can be universalized. Yeah, you know, so like, uh, you know, always steal if you, you know, if you want to and your name is, you know, whatever, <laughs> something like that, yeah. right? So, um, um, I mean, obviously, uh, Kant must have something to say about it on that gross level. I, I don't want to get into exactly what Kant would say about it. We're not talking about Kant, but get, get, like getting back to Royce. So, like, so, so uh, Royce is trying to supply a principle that will tell you what to want in the first place. <laughs> so you say you won't have desires at all until you have the world. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have desires, but they have, but they don't add up to one overriding desire, right? They're just, oh, so they're weird. incoherent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you have to, you have to choose something and the principle tells you to choose something, but, um, but it also tells you how to choose it. Namely, um, it has to be uh, compatible with everyone else doing the same thing. So, I mean, the, the universality is, is still there as it, you know, but it's, I think it comes in at a slightly different point. Um, um, now, um, but I mean, it does have in common with the categorical imperative that I think we have to say that this principle is a priori. Right? I mean, this is a principle that applies before you know what you want. <laughs> so, like, in a sense, like, before you were born or, you know, that is, it's not derived from experience. Um, I mean, a priori doesn't really mean innate. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, but that's kind of a metaphor for it. Like before you became a human being, before you became yourself, this principle already applied to you. So, um, which makes, I guess this is one of the things that makes Royce less of a pragmatist than, um, than you might think, right? I mean, this is, uh, this isn't just a principle we adopted because it works. <laughs> right. So anyway, so that's the principle um, that is, that's the principle that's it's supposed to follow from the fact that every individual, universally speaking, requires loyalty. Um, Seems like you need some further assumption for that to follow. Um, they, that is from the fact that every that this is the highest good for every individual. Now, when I make my choice, I'm supposed to be um, 
therefore I have to worry about everyone else's ability to get to, to choose loyalty. Um, I mean, you know, like you could plug in a kind of quasi utilitarian principle and say, right, like, oh, since it's my duty to maximize the highest good for everyone, and the highest good for everyone is loyalty, therefore, um, um, says that. What? I think he literally says that the most, but you should do that which maximizes the most loyalty. Yeah, right. But the question is, does that derive from like a, that mean, yeah, so we're, that's what we're trying to get to. You should maximize other, everyone's opportunities for loyalty. But the question is, you know, so we start with loyalty is the best thing for every individual. And we get to, you should try to maximize the opportunities for everyone to be loyal. So if you put in between, you should try to maximize the good for every individual, then that would follow. But if you don't put that in between, then it's, then it's hard. But maybe there's some other way. I'm not sure. Because um, that would be, um, I mean, I don't know, why would that be bad? It would, you know, like, it would mean that Royce agrees with Edwards about that, basically, right? That you, the true virtue is universal benevolence. I guess, it would, I mean, it would be disappointing because he doesn't really talk about that. And so, like, uh, it almost seems like he's unconsciously relying on it or something, which is not what you'd like to see from a philosopher. Um, but, uh, um, but it also maybe makes it seem like the whole thing about loyalty is less fundamental than you might have thought, right? But like the real principle here is universal benevolence. And the loyalty thing is like a footnote. Oh, by the way, the highest good for everyone is loyalty. Um, um, but I don't know if that's the only way to make the argument work. Seems like there might be other ways to think about it, but I don't know. But someone has an idea. That's this is a way to know loyalty. Why would they choose this supreme loyalty? Like if they have no overarching desire, which is the only loyalty you can give, why would they choose? Like why would they choose loyalty at all? Or? Yeah. Um, well, that's a separate question. Yeah, I guess. Um, it's kind of a mysterious moment, right? Like the instant where the individual passes from being this incoherent mass of desires to having chosen a self. Um, um, I mean, it's a kind of mysterious moment that often comes up and comes up one way or another in philosophical discussions of ethics. But I don't know if that makes it any better. Yeah, like it seems like the self, like in that instant, chooses itself and therefore brings itself into existence. Um, um, and does that make sense? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, well, I guess, so, okay, so maybe it's not quite that bad. Like, remember that you have to choose a cause that's actually a living cause that's offered to you by the social order. So, and 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 if you don't do this, the social order is going to push you into some slot anyway, right? So, I mean, it's still a little bit mysterious, but it's not like something out of nothing. It's, right, it's, it's the question of what you do at that moment when, you know, so, like, um, 
at that moment when Charles the first asks him, are you know, do you see these five people here? Um uh like everything gets focused down to the choice he has to make, whether he wants it to or not, right? He can't bring in all his other desires. Um, he has to make this one choice. And I mean, he, he can make it by just kind of going with the flow. Um, but, uh, but it's at that instant where there's like an opportunity to um, not just be pushed one direction or the other, but to like really acquiesce in being pushed to one direction or the other. Um, I don't know if that makes it a little bit, yeah, but um, so anyway, like wh whether this can be derived in the way Royce tries to or not, I'm not sure. I mean, then the question is, so how is this gonna to work to help us choose a cause? Um, well, first of all, it's supposed to explain why certain causes are, and actually a lot of causes <laughs> to which people are loyal are bad in and of themselves and we shouldn't be loyal to them. Um, basically, uh, any cause that's, as Royce puts it, predatory, right? Like being loyal to it means destroying other causes to which people are loyal. Um, this is a, this is a little bit weird because so a a, a loyal cause of loyalty is kind of like a living thing and this kind is being compared to predators but um, do we think predators are bad there shouldn't be predators I mean I guess some people do think that uh, let's see they're more necessary than bad <laughs> it seems like among the animals. <laughs> no, I mean, it seems like among animals, predators are, well, I mean, so if, if predators had never evolved. Well, so I think that relies on, I think, the assumption that we can give ethical consideration to things like nature, which I don't think no, it's evolved, or like, which feasible, I guess, for the better word. You're not going to sit down with a lion and discuss farts and your <laughs> corporate get farts on the lion. Yeah, well, no, I mean, it's true that, uh, but like, uh, um, so, but it's supposed to be an analogy, right? Like, it's supposed to be an analogy, I think, between the value of loyalty and the value of life, right? And so, um, you know, like, um, life is a different kind of good than loyalty, but it's somehow like an analogous good, right? And so, like, if, if we approve of life, generally speaking, then it seems like Royce is saying that we should disapprove of predators. Yeah, this might be a silly question, but what if there was like a group that their whole purpose was like to, I guess, like impede on the freedom of others? And I decide to be loyal to a group that impedes that group from impeding on others? What? Or is that like too recursive? Well, you know, so like what he says is that. Um, He says that the that the truly loyal, that is the people who are loyalty, who are loyal out of the principle of loyalty to loyalty, will um uh you know not approve of attacking other people's loyalty except when it's necessary, right? So I mean, I think he has that case covered, although as I said, 
before, like, you, you know, we're not such great judges of that. <laughs> we, I mean, like, uh, um, and often both sides think they're doing that, right? Like, think about the United States fighting with Al Qaeda. So, like, you know, like people on both sides may think that they're that 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 violence is necessary because they're fighting against such an evil cause. <laughs> Um, right. So, I mean, so so this won't solve all problems, but like, the, but the truth is, Royce doesn't claim that this is going to, you know, that this is going to give us a way of make, like, automatically making all our decisions. Because, the, you know, the question is, what what principle are we trying to apply? Um, so I, I think as far as that goes, it's, it's, you know, it's a usable answer. Like I said, there's something weird about the analogy with life. Um, and um, after all, like this, this is also the time when uh, maybe it's a little past the heyday of the time, but the time when people are applying or misapplying Darwinism to uh, you know to social issues. Um, actually, you know, I was looking to see if Jane Adams ever mentions Royce. And she does. Um, I didn't find a lot of places, but one place she mentions, well, so you don't know who she is yet because I haven't talked about her yet, but <laughs> she's reading her next week. But um, she, you know, she says that she had like a reading group with young people one summer where they read a book by Royce and they read it because um, she, um, um, wanted to show them that there was someone else who was dealing with the fundamental questions of life besides Herbert Spencer. <laughs> Herbert Spencer was this like famous social Darwinist, right? So, um, so, uh, so Royce is definitely taking a stand against that, uh, but it's weird because then is he saying that the way uh, evolution works among literal living things is bad? I mean, again, like, so nowadays, of course, we have people like, I don't know, like Peter, I don't know if Peter Singer himself says this, but that type of people who are like, um, um, yeah, ideally, we should try to, like, remove all animals from nature and feed them, you know, without letting them prey on each other. <laughs> um, or even, like, we should try to reduce biodiversity because the more animals there are in nature, the more suffering there is. <laughs> but like, assuming you don't want to go that way. <laughs> um, uh, and it seems like something must have gone wrong before you got to that point. <laughs> that, that's what it seems like to me anyway. Well, Peter Singer, doesn't he also like, he talks about collective infanticide, like killing disabled people. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he does. He's, you know, like, I, I don't know. He's, well, it's, yeah, I don't want to talk more about Peter Singer. So, <laughs> go back to Royce. Um, so, um, so anyway, uh, there's something weird about that, but other than that, is the you know the principle seems usable for this purpose. Um, so like you shouldn't be loyal to a family that's in a feud or to a warlike nation. Um, and of course, this also means, as Roy says, that. Sometimes you may have chosen loyalty to a cause, and then you may find puts this more in terms of like learning something new, which I guess is one way it can happen. But I think also the cause could change, right? <laughs> like you chose loyalty to your family, but now your family has got involved in this violent feud. And so at this point, so so Roy says, yeah, under those conditions and only those conditions, you should abandon your loyalty, you should break your loyalty. If you find that the cause that you're loyal to is now, you know, no longer allowed by this principle. 
Um, but so, I mean, so that, so it's supposed to work negatively and we can kind of see how that's supposed to happen. I mean, there's another kind of weird thing about this which is um, granted that everyone's highest good is loyalty. Does, do you deprive them of that good by like defeating their cause? Um, or, I mean, or I guess even more pressingly by attacking their cause, suppose you don't defeat it, but you attack it. So, you know, actually, when when Royce compares the um, search for power to loyalty, he says that, you know, like making power the principle of your life, among other reasons it won't work, is because you'll always fail in the end, right? Like you're going to die and whatever power you have is going to, you know, won't work, won't help you in the end. So he says, well, wait, couldn't you say that about loyalty too? And he says, yes, but it's okay because the loyal person isn't playing to win, <laughs> right? They're just like, uh, what's important to them is that, you know, they gave everything they had to the cause. Um, and it doesn't matter if the cause prevails. So, uh, you know, you might almost think that you can, um, best help people's loyalty by attacking their cause. <laughs> right? Like, you'll be destroying their cause or anyway, impeding their cause, but you won't be destroying their loyalty. You can't, like, you can't get at that. Well, I mean, Royce says, I guess maybe sometimes you can, but, um, um, but it's not obvious that that's going to be the result. And, you know, you might think that if you plug that in correctly, you would get a position more like Nietzsche, you know, that like, yeah, like the um, the way to show, uh, the way to be benevolent to people is to like attack them and discipline them. <laughs> I, I don't know, but shouldn't, Nietzsche doesn't have simple positions like that, but <laughs> like a position that you may find in Nietzsche or something. <laughs> um, Right. So anyway, but um, so yeah. So it's not clear either how this is derived or whether it really de delivers the result we want. But um, but maybe there's more that can be said about that from Royce's point of view. Um, in any case, I mean, this is also so. This is we can see how this is supposed to work negatively. It's also supposed to work positively. So like when you choose between two causes, you're supposed to be able to ask which one promotes better universal loyalty. So even if neither of them is, is predatory, still one may be better than the other. Um, right, and as Royce summarizes it, this is on page 121. In so and this is the this is the principle of loyalty to loyalty. Insofar as it lies in your power, so choose your cause and so serve it that by reason of your choice and of your service, there shall be more loyalty in the world rather than less. Now, I mean, obviously, this isn't going to. Uh, and this is what I was saying before. This isn't going to give a, like an easily ascertained objective standard by which you can choose one cause over another. Um, I mean, like, for one thing, uh, besides the issue of bias that I was talking about before, there's also, like, you don't have enough information to, to make that decision. And who knows what's going to happen in the future and what will better serve the cause of loyalty. Um, um, and, um, 
first of all, I think Royce thinks, and I think he may be right about that, that that's an advantage in a philosophical principle like this, right? Like, I mean, it certainly prevents him from cranking out absurd consequences, like we should practice infanticide or whatever. <laughs> you know, like, um, you're going to have to use your, your own judgment to make these decisions. Um, um, uh, but he also, he, he thinks this doesn't create an impossible problem for the person making these decisions because what, what they can derive from this principle is um, that they can't hesitate too long to decide. They have to decide and um, they have to do their best based on the information and judgment that they're able to make. Um, this is similar to, or maybe exactly the same as what uh, Descartes says in the um, discourse on the method, when he says, like, when it comes to theoretical questions, um, you should suspend judgment unless, unless you're absolutely certain. But when it comes to practical questions, um, you have to decide, even if you have no information, pick something and stick with it, right? And he uses the example of someone who's stuck in the woods, the lost in the woods. And he says, like, even if they don't know anything about which direction is better, they should choose one direction and just keep walking that way. That way, you know, he says, at, they don't know where they end up, but they'll probably end up somewhere that's better than being lost in the woods. <laughs> so, I mean, in real life, if you're lost in the woods, you're supposed to stay exactly where you are. But that's based on the assumption that someone's looking for you, right? That, you know, so, but Descartes's not talking about that situation. You're lost in the woods and no one is looking for you. What should you do? Yeah, just pick a direction and start walking. <laughs> And try to stick to it as best you can, otherwise you'll end up walking in circles. Right. Anyway, so like that. I don't know why I'm starting to segue into giving you advice because you're lost in the woods. Um, so, <laughs> but, so I think that's the same principle that Royce is, is invoking here. He's saying that like when it comes to a practical decision, um uh making no decision is is like the worst thing you can do. So you just have to do your best. Um, and this is where he brings in that test case of the, it says it's a, a, a case that students have raised with them. The case of, quote, a young woman who has to decide between loyalty to her profession and loyalty to her family. Um, um, So, you know, there's definitely some like sexist assumptions built into this discussion. <laughs> um, uh, it's, you know, um, like one of the situations he says that she may find herself in is that like um, the father or mother of her nieces or nephews has died and now they need another person to help them out. So, but the thing is, like, did the father of her nieces and nephews have to decide between helping them and, and having a profession? Probably not, right? So, like, you couldn't set this up the other way around. <laughs> um, right, so anyway, so, like, but, I mean, what's surprising about that? Someone's writing in 1908 about decisions that young women are making and like that there's some kind of sexist assumption, obviously, right? So, but, but you know, but like leaving that aside for the moment is, you know, uh, this really is a type of decision that lots of people face, men and women today also. Um, and Royce says, um, you know, she's gonna have to decide for herself. And yeah, she's not going to be sure she's making the right decision, but she has to decide. Um, and she says the same thing about Robert E. Lee. <laughs> so as I said, 
that, like, when you say that about the young woman, that sounds relatively attractive. When you say that about Robert E. Lee, he's trying to decide whether to fight for the Union or the Confederacy. Um, now it's a little bit <laughs> less attractive. Um, but again, maybe that's just because. What is it because? I don't think Royce can get out of this so easily. I'm actually about to talk about the Civil War from Royce's point of view. So let me come back to this when I talk about that. Um, okay, so I think that's everything I have to say about this first one. Are there more questions or comments or criticisms? Why is it there were so many people here last time? I thought it went well last time. <laughs> but I don't know. This is like exam week. Yeah. 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 It's been some weeks. We're all yes. getting work done. Pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, maybe they're all watching. You're gonna all watch the recording. All right. All right. So, um, um, anyway, so I want to talk about this one now. You know, um. You might expect from Royce that he would not only have something to say about loyalty as a particularly American issue, but even about loyalty as a particularly Californian issue. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, I think there he you know, so he doesn't discuss California in this book. Although, as I said, he also wrote a history of California. Um, um, but I. I think I will be able to say something a little bit Californian about what he says. So we'll see. So, um, so anyway, like one issue he discusses, um, and and in a sense, this is an overriding theme in his discussion of the issue of loyalty to America, um, is the tension between local and national loyalty. So he says that before the Civil War, this was the main problem about loyalty to America. Um, right, this begins on page 233. <laughs> Um, and he says how this is different from the history of other countries. We have never had to war against a privileged class. This is very questionable, but anyway, that's what he says. Our constitutional problem which led to the Civil War was a different problem from that which the French Revolution or the English political wars of the 17th century have exemplified. At one time, loyalty to the nation stood in the minds of many of our people in strong contrast to their loyalty to their state or to their section of the country. This contrast led in many cases to a bitter conflict between the two sorts of loyal interests. At last, such conflicts had to be decided by war. So it turns out, and I think this should be jarring out after the people we were reading from right before the Civil War, it turns out that the Civil War was not about slavery, it was about states' rights. <laughs> I mean, of course, we've all heard that position, right? But that's what Royce is saying. Right? Like he doesn't even mention slavery when he when he talks about the causes of the Civil War. Um, what's that? State rights to what? State rights to what? Well, I mean, so. I mean, maybe state rights isn't exactly the way to put what he's he's saying, right? But it's loyalty to a state. That's right. So it's harder to say to fill in the what there. It's still there, but it's harder to fill it in. And that's part, perhaps part of Royce's problem with understanding this, right? Um, that, you know, it's... Uh, um, He's, 
he's not focusing on what it is that loyalty to a to a given state involves. I mean, I sh so like I should say he's not completely wrong. He's not completely wrong, <laughs> right? I mean, there were other conflicts between states. There was, I think, what was this? Um, like Wisconsin. I don't know, one of those states when it was first formed in the Midwest, there was like almost a war between like the 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 bordering states because of like what you know over which territory was gonna belong to which. Um, and also, you know, the 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 first time a state in the South tried to um nullify a federal law, it was about tariffs. Um, and Andrew Jackson sent in federal troops to put it down. Now, I mean, are arguments about tariffs unconnected to slavery? No, nothing in the South in this period or the North was unconnected to slavery. I'm sure it was connected. But so anyway, I mean, that that's just by way of trying to, to I mean, to, the, there really was such a thing as loyalty to your state or to your section of the country. And that really was a tension. But still, it's bizarre to say, and again, especially considering the people we've read from before the Civil War who can't talk about anything else, <laughs> um, that, uh, that here we are. All right, at least I'm recording again. Now there's like, only still 10 minutes left. All right. Um, what was I talking about before that happened? And is it going to happen again? Okay, what was I talking about? Oh, this is, oh, right. So, um, so it's bizarre. And also, like, what goes along with that is saying that we've, that we've never had to war against a privileged class. Like, so that is uh, um, not counting uh, white people as a privileged class. <laughs> right, so, um, or privileged caste. <laughs> um, so, okay, anyway, that's what he says about that. But he's, anyway, he says that issue is now settled. That was the problem with loyalty to America. That it was that, you know, that people had a hard time being loyal to America because they were more loyal to their local um, uh, state or section. Um, but he says, um, it seems like this, the settlement of that issue, according to him, has created a new problem. Um, because now the unit that's available for loyalty is too big and impersonal. Um, so, um, Right, so this is on page 240. I'm not going to look for it in my text because it's a long time. Um, since such a society is so vast as to be no longer easily intelligible, not only its political, but also its other social powers appear to the individual in a similarly estranged and arbitrary fashion. Um, or as it says in the previous page, this, this state, which is no longer provincial, but is now imperialistic. Now, by imperialistic, he doesn't mean here like trying to conquer other states, even though obviously that's the other thing that all of, that just happened, the Mexican-American War, right? But that's not what he means by imperialistic now. He just means it's too big, it's like an empire rather than a province. Um, and he says that it seems to the individual like a great nature natural force rather than his own loyal self writ large. So, um, 
So you might think of this as kind of the Californian <laughs> speaking. This is what I said. I thought I could get a little bit of California in here. Like, you know, when California was admitted to the union, um, there was a proposal that, that it should be admitted as two states, North California and South California. And South California would be a slave state. And North California would be a free state. Um, so that didn't happen, obviously. Instead, it was admitted, yeah. People are still trying to make it happen with the state of Jefferson. Yeah, yeah. Although, hopefully, they, they, they can't make it a slave state. But yeah, <laughs> some people are trying. And, and it's um and it's, it's it's the other way around right because south california was yeah so anyway be that as it may um but the point is california didn't end up splitting that way people here didn't want to do it and people here didn't want to do it because of a reason that's like i mean it was certainly true in 1850 but it's still kind of true now that people in California had just come from everywhere and, and were all mixed up. Um, and they kind of like left their sectional loyalties behind. Now what's happening? What's this giant black? I don't know. Trying to play the video? I don't know. All right. Oh, I hope my computer isn't dying. Sorry. So, um, so this, like, so in a sense, like a move to California is a kind of like move away from particularity towards exposure to this giant, um, uh, this vast nation that's hard to be loyal to. I, I think you can, you maybe can say that we still have some version of that. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, Anyway, it's the most, the only Californian thing I could find <laughs> in this book. Um, it's, in any case, it's still like, it's not the most interesting problem from the point of view of this course. Maybe if it's for a person in Californian philosophy, but like, I don't know if we agreed other than Royce, but um, uh, um, but like from the point of view of this course, it's not the most interesting problem because for one thing, Royce says that there's nothing peculiarly American about this problem, right? He says it in exactly those words. This is on page 238. These problems, quote, are not peculiar to our American people. They seem to my mind to be merely symptomatic of something which naturally belongs to the general type of civilization upon which in our national history, we are entering, right? And then he, uses this Hegelian term, spirit estranged from itself, which Hegel applies to the Roman Empire. And I think Hegel may be also thinking about the Napoleonic Empire, although Royce doesn't say that. But anyway, um, um, he, Royce also may not completely grasp what Hegel is saying here, but I won't get into that. All right. So, um, so this is not a peculiarly American problem. He does discuss a problem that is more peculiarly American. And this is the problem, as he puts it, this is on page 211, of doing something to satisfy the moral needs of our American community while leaving the liberties of the people intact. So this is kind of familiar, right? Like, the solution to this problem in the case of um, America is going to be dangerous because, uh, like, what you want to do is, and like, for example, what Royce himself proposes, but I'm not sure how this is supposed to work, is that we need a new provincialism where people will again be loyal to their, to, you know, I mean, Uh, that's kind of sounds like he's forgotten what it's like to be California, <laughs> right? But in any case, uh, we, yeah, we need this new provincialism where people will somehow be loyal to their local area. And, you know, like, how is that going to work if everyone takes off across the country to the gold rush? <laughs> but, um, um,
I don't have time left to do justice to this. Um, because what I want, maybe I'll talk about this a little bit next time because, but this is going to be too much about Adams to talk about next time. But because this is where Royce brings in this is, the issue, somehow this is connected to the problem of the huge wave of immigration that has just arrived, right? Including uh, my father's parents are part of that wave of immigration, right? And Royce is talking about like the, the problem is how we can um, teach those people loyalty um, consistent, you know, and it's, um, Um, I think from his point of view that that earnest young man who's the son of Russian immigrants is like an example of this. How can we teach them, how can we give them an example of loyalty that's American, they can understand that values their individuality? Um, and it doesn't seem to them like an example of the, the bad thing that they just escaped from. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more to say about that, but we're out of time. So I'll see you next week. Sorry for technical difficulties.